Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Um, so, all right, so last class we were discussing um, uh, BigQuery and Dremel, that system architecture, and as I said, the, you know, the, the Dremel work was the, served as a foundation or a, a blueprint for how people build a lot of modern OLAP systems. Now, not everyone's going to have bits and pieces that, that Dremel has, and there certainly has been extensions to the overall architecture using other systems, but at a high level, that's, that's the approach of uh, when people say you're building a modern OLAP or, or lake house system. And when we see Snowflake next week, and certainly Spark today, uh, it's gonna look very similar, it's a bits and pieces. So to just understand uh, you know, the Databricks Photon paper uh, that you guys read, we wanna sort of first talk about the history of how sort of Spark came about uh, and what led them to building the, the, the accelerator the way, they, the way that they did. Um, so again, if you flash back to maybe like late 2000s, uh, when MapReduce was, was taking off, at the same time there was this project uh, called Spark uh, at, a, at a UC Berkeley um, where they were trying to build a, a better version of, of, of the sort of MapReduce Hadoop model. And some parts are very similar, like separating compute and storage. Um, you know, way HDFS had, Hadoop had HDFS and then and the extra executor nodes. Um, but then they also had support to do sort of iterator algorithms the way you couldn't do very easily in Hadoop that uh, could allow you to take multiple passes on the same data set within, you know, within, uh, within your program. So when they wrote Spark, they wrote it in the Scala because that was the hot thing. Uh, that was the language everyone was most excited about uh, in, around this time, 2010. Now it's obviously Rust. Right before that, it was Go. Before Go, it was, it was Scala. Um, Py Python's always, sort of always been there. Right, so because the... Uh, because Spark is written in Scala, that means that they're going to run on the JVM. Now, from pretty much all the papers we've talked about this entire semester, most of them are written in C++. Right? Rust is becoming more common now, but it's been C++ is the main thing we've been focused on. But there's still a lot of database systems that are out there that are going to be written in, in Java, mostly because they come around from the late 2000s, early 2010s. Um, and we've avoided sort of implementation discuss discussions about the programming languages using these systems, but for today's paper, if you guys read about, like, because it, it Spark was really written in Java or Scala running the JVM, right, that, that matters and that's going to restrain what they, they can do in their implementation. So the first version of Spark that came out only supported this really low-level uh, API based on these, these sort of RDDs or resilient data, data, distributed data structures. Um, it was, think of this like it's the, it's the, the output of, of a sort of some task computation was put in this RDD wrapper. Later on, they added support for, for the data frame API uh, for even higher level abstraction um, and programming language. And this is sort of, I think, when Spark really started taking off. So now, instead of running your, your, your pandas programs or accessing you know, data frames in Python, you, know, you could run this now in, in Spark and go, go, go distribute it. But again, but, but at this point, again, the early version, first version of Spark didn't support SQL. It was all, the, again, these, these other programming languages. So once you start having a, some kind of computational framework that can process large amounts of data uh, become popular, people are going to start asking for SQL, right? And that's what people, that's what people wanted in, uh, in Spark. So the stop got, for the first sort of su su support within Spark was this thing called Shark, um, and is where they forked Facebook's Hive middleware that took SQL queries and converted them to that produce jobs. They forked that and then took SQL queries and then converted it into uh, Spark programs right, using the Spark API, right? Uh, and this was limited because the support, the, the capabilities of this approach was limited because it was, you could only use SQL for like the, the initial invocation of, of the program or the query you wanted. So it, wasn't, so it wasn't like you could take the, you couldn't intermix like Python code or the, the Spark API code with SQL in different parts. Like you couldn't take the output of a SQL query, feed that into you know, a, a Scala program, but then they took the output of that and then feed that all within the same program into SQL. It's only, you, can only, you couldn't mix the SQL and API calls at the time. The other challenge that they faced too was that uh, Shark was based on Hive, and the Hive query optimizer was really designed for picking the best query plan to generate MapReduce jobs. 
And so they had to try to contort it to uh, make it work in Spark, but Spark had a more uh, expressive API. You could do more things uh, in, in your program than you could in just MapReduce, because MapReduce only exposed two functions, Map and Reduce. And so, there's, so, so the queries that they were generating through, this, through Shark were not as efficient as one could build if you written by hand, because Hive's optimizer just you know, wasn't, wasn't aware, didn't know about the other things it could do with, um, with, you know, with Spark programs. Right, so again, this was a stopgap solution and the initial approach to add uh, SQL support in, in, um, in, in Spark. And I think I mentioned last, last class also as well, right, there was this other system called Impala uh, that was, came out of Cloudera. Um, and Cloudera was actually the one shipping the most Spark in the early days, right? They, because people were asking for it. It was part of like the sort of Cloudera distribution you would get. Um, but then when people started asking for SQL support in, in, uh, in Spark, Cloudera wouldn't provide them Shark because they wanted the people to use Cloudera or use Impala instead because they made money on that, right? So even though this was available, again, as, as a sort of add-on to Spark, uh, it wasn't available in Cloudera's, um, you know, cloud dis cloud dis distribution of it. So then in 2015, the, the Databricks team put out Spark SQL. And this was native integration of SQL directly in the, the, the Spark runtime, right? And now in this case, when you, when you download Spark, you got Spark SQL. And so Cloudera couldn't excise it out. They had, you know, when they shipped Spark, they also shipped you know, Spark SQL with that. And that basically undercut any, uh, any need to use Impala, and it's sort of like, it was like a Trojan horse, basically helped destroy, or not destroy, like, because Cloudera is still around. It helped undermine uh, Cloudera, and, you know, Databricks became the, the, you know, the big company it is now, and Cloudera got, they went IPO, but then they got reverted back to private equity. Um, and I think Databricks uh, helped facilitate that in some ways. Another problem was, despite the name of having Cloud and, and the name Cloudera, they didn't have a cloud offering of MapReduce, of Hadoop. Like Amazon was making more money on Hadoop than uh, Cloudera was, even though they had like, the, you know, the inventor of Hadoop there and a bunch of other people that were you know, key contributors to it. But that, that's, a, that's an aside. All right, so the way Spark SQL worked was that they uh, would still rely on sort of the row-based architecture of, or the, the feeding data in from, from the lower levels of the query plan. Um, but when they passed data from one operator to the next, uh, they would at least st now start storing it in columnar uh, buffers or vectors. They would support dictionary encoding, RLE, bit packing compression stuff, all the stuff we did before. And now they would also introduce an in-memory shuffle phase to go between the, the, the query stages or between the different pipelines. The way this actually would, would work was um, they weren't doing full query compilation the way we saw in Hyper. They would just do compilation of the where clauses. And they would do this by converting the where clauses into uh, like Scala a ASTs. And then there was an internal method in Scala to then generate the, the basically compile this into the JVM bytecode. And then you could you'd link that in and invoke it within it. So they were doing partial query compilation to help speed things up. Um, but there was, you know, th th there was other challenges that, that, that they were going to face. Um, so, I also point out also too that if you, if you read the, the Spark SQL paper, um, they, they had this little blurb here they talk about for their in-memory shuffle. In the original version of it, they just relied on the OS page cache to keep things in memory uh, and then only you know, use that to spill to disk when necessary. But then, you know, as you'll see in Photon, they got rid of that because the OS was just messing everything up and this became non-scalable. So there's another good example, like you don't want to let the operating system ruin your life or do anything um, you know, do anything for you, you won't let the data system do everything uh, by itself, right? Because the overhead of like the syscalls, the overhead of like the journaling in the file system, like all that was, was, was causing problems. So the other challenge of this is that the uh, converting things into this Scala AST, or converting, like doing cogen for the where clauses and then um, compiling that came to be a challenge because there was a sort of limit of how big the program you, you could you could cogen inside of um, in, in, you know directly inside of the JVM, and they were finding that the the when they were run SQL queries they were becoming CPU bound rather than disk bound, 
um, and there's just too much computational overhead of, of, of doing this approach that it became problematic. And again, this is 2015, 2000, so say maybe 2015, 2020, your disks are super fast now, but at the time, you would expect your data warehouse or OLAP system to be always disk bound, not CPU bound, right? Nowadays, the, 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 the pendulum has sort of swung the other, other way, and the CPUs are becoming the bottleneck, not the disk, but when they were building this, the, this, the, the, the disk was not slowing down, it was, it was the CPU. So they, in the, the Photon paper, they point out a bunch of observations about this, the Spark SQL attempt. Uh, and, you know, the first one I already, as I said, that the, the workload is becoming CPU bound just because there was just so much computational overhead of everything that they were doing. Um, and they had to be, you know, they spent a lot of time trying to work around the JVM in that sort of memory managed environment, and doing things like, I don't know how much you know about like Java programming, but like when you allocate something like you call a new object, you know, that goes in the heap, the, the, the JVM's garbage collectors keep track references to it, and every time you run a garbage collection pass, you check to see whether anybody is, you know, still pointing to it, and then you, you can free the memory, right? Uh, there's no like direct malloc call in, in the JVM. So the way you get around this, you do off heap memory, you, you basically within, uh, within the JVM or Java code, it's like an unsafe in Rust, you can allocate memory to some outside region. It's still owned by the process, but the, J, the, the garbage collector isn't gonna go look inside of it to see if anybody it can free any memory. So they had to do a bunch of engineering effort to move stuff out of the, you know, off heap so that the garbage collector would, wouldn't slow them down. And that just becomes uh, just sort of problematic. Uh, it's a lot of engineering effort just to get around you know, the internals of the JVM. The other challenge that they faced was the, doing the JIT compilations uh, piece was particularly tricky because in order to get the best performance out of it, you had to have people that really know how to, uh, the internals of the JVM. Um, and it, they found, they had trouble scaling up the, the engineering team to be able to optimize the Spark SQL engine because it's really, you need people that had experience actually in the internals of the JVM. Versus like, you know, a bunch of C++ developers can, can jump in and start writing code on anything, right? They had other limitations of how big the, again, the, the, the code gen code itself could be. Uh, so the paper mentions, in the Photon paper you guys read, that if the, column, if the table had more than hundreds of, you know, a couple hundreds of columns, which are pretty common sometimes, uh, then, they, then the JVM would just say, I, this is too big to compile and throw it back to run it to the slow interpreted mode. So they're basically dealing with this, this remnant of the early 2010s of like, okay, let's build this on the JVM, because that's how, how people were building scalable, you know, big data systems at the time. But then when, as the hardware landscape changed, as the demands of what, what, uh, what people wanted to do with the database system changed, they were sort of hit, hitting the upper limits of what the JVM could support. So they had to come up with a way to, to, to overcome this. So this, that's the background for the paper you guys, you guys read uh, for Photon. So as I said last class, Photon isn't a standalone system like Dremel uh, or, or Snowflake when we read next, that next week, right? But rather it's a, it's a library that would, that's meant to embed inside of an existing database system like Spark or, or the the Spark runtime or what they call the Databricks runtime. But it's even more low level than the Velox paper we read before where at least Velox was providing a, you know, a, not a full execution engine, but pretty much all the pieces or components we need for the execution engine, like thread pools, all the operators and so forth. It's even, it's Photon is even smaller than that. It's really individual, what they call kernels or tasks or operators that you can then put in uh, at a really fine grain within the query plan itself. But all the threading, all the memory management, all of that's going to be handled by something else. In this case here, it's going to be the, the database runtime. And we'll see alternative approaches to accelerate Spark at the end where they're not going to do, the way, do it the way Photon did it, where, like, again, just injecting the Photon accelerated operators within the query plan at, at specific locations. Uh, the alternative approaches we'll see will just take the physical query plan, ignore all of Spark, and run it somewhere else using like data fusion or a whole other database system. So the, the, the idea here, the, so the high level design goal of Photon is that they wanted to integrate with what they'll call the DataVix runtime or the Spark runtime. It's, the DataVix runtime is the proprietary version of this, of, of Spark. Um, but they wanted to be able to integrate it with the, the DBR without throwing out all of, 
of the, the existing infrastructure. And that, at over, that as over time, as they expand the scope or the capabilities of what Photon can support, they can then just in, you know, incrementally add those pieces into override the ones in, uh, in the database runtime. Again, without disrupting any of the users. Uh, you don't want the, you don't want someone to run a query, you know, one week, and on an early version of Photon that maybe doesn't have certain, certain tasks implemented, and get one result, and then next week they run the exact same query and the exact same data, but now Photon is, 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 has been upgraded, and now they are getting back different results. I say they want to avoid all of this and make this completely transparent to their users. Other than charging, charge, they charge you more for it. Um, so, uh, right, so, so they want to support all of the, the, the semantics and capabilities of the earlier SQL engine and the data frame API, but again, without having any, um, any, any you know, changes in natural results or high-level behaviors. And then they also want to be able to handle the, uh, the again, the, the legacy artifact that the Spark runtime is going to be you know, handing out individual rows one at a time and convert it to a column-oriented or vector-oriented implementation to speed things up, right? And so the basic way it's going to work is that queries are going to, uh, some portion of a query will be able to run in, in Photon, but if we recognize that we, for the, what the query actually wants to do, if we don't have a Photon accelerated implementation of that task or operator, then we just fall back to the slow path of the, um, you know, of, of the original Spark runtime. So we'll talk about it in a second how they're going to do this, but the way you do this in the JVM is using what's called the JNI, or Java Native Interface. It basically allows you to, to have Java code then invoke C++ code. Like the thread that then, that, that's running the JVM now goes down to your C++ code and can, can do whatever it wants. And the paper they talk about the overhead of making that JNI call was roughly about the same as doing a, a virtual function lookup in C++. I think it's like 23, 23 to 25 nanoseconds per call. It's not free, right? But it's it's uh, it's not like you know because we're, we're just going to pass around memory buffers and memory pointers in the same same process. It's not like we had to copy things from one process to the next. So for the paper you guys read, uh, what's super awesome about it, at least for me as as a professor that, that I like, is that when you look at the author list, there's a lot of CMU people here, right? So Prashant Menon was my num number one PG student uh, that actually worked on code and query compilation stuff. Uh, so he worked on this system. Yudkarsh and Arvin, they were master students here. They took 721, the same class you guys took here. Uh, and they went off to, to Databricks. Ryan Johnson did his PhD at CMU. Uh, I think he graduated in 2010, but, so before I showed up. But I'm pretty sure he took 720 and, 721 and TA'd it like 2006, the earlier version of it. Um, and there's a bunch of other people in the, um, the bunch of other people in the, 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 the citation list, the bibliography of the paper, like, you know, Alison Wang's my former student. They, they cite a blog article when she's at Databricks working on stuff. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of CMUDB alum at, at Databricks working on this project, which is super cool. I, this is basically why you should take this class, but, you know, we're already into, like, whatever, the 12th week, so you're here. All right. So here's the high-level overview of what, what Photon's going to have. Right, again, some of this will be in the context of the overall Spark system, like shared disk and disk aggregate storage, right, the, the separate computing storage. Um, but the ones that we're going to, one we're going to focus on is the pool-based vectorized execution and then the, the, the pre-compiled primitives. Um, we'll see how they're going to do shuffle-based uh, distribution, just like in Dremel, no, nothing, nothing really radical there. They do sort merge and hash joins, and then we'll also talk a little about how they're doing um, query optimization and uh, and, and, and adaptivity. So the overall architecture looks a, look a lot like Dremel, right? We have some distributed file system. We have a query shows up. It gets sent to what they call a driver, but Dremel called the coordinator. Uh, you'll see Snowflake next week. They'll call this, I think, the, the compute service or something like that. At a high level, again, it's some node that's responsible for taking the query, generating the query plan, hand, handing it off to some scheduler, and make sure the task get executed. Right. So the, in, the, in the first stage here, the, the executors fire up, and they'll start pulling data from the, the, the distributed file system. They'll do some kind of computation on it. Um, and then they're going to start writing it out to, uh, for the shuffle phase. But in the default version, uh, like if you just download Spark, you'll, the, they're going to do a local in-memory shuffle store. Um, so I mean, they're going to write to a, uh, basically a hash table that's local to them. 
and then other workers will, can pull from them in the next stage. But as we also saw in the last class, we have the ability to also write out to a remote shuffle service like Uniful or Apache Celeborn, right? It, it, for our purposes, it, do, it doesn't matter. And then in the, the second stage, again, it's the, the executors, and the next stage are going to be pulling from the, the previous stage. And again, like if it's, if it's not a remote service, these guys have to stick around until this, you know, the, you know, these guys fire up again. And whether or not you can be clever and say, okay, well, this guy is going to be on the same thing as this guy, so I can reuse my local memory, right? That's outside, that's done sort of high level uh, scheduler. And then we fire up the next stage, produce the final result, and send it out. And again, at high level, this looks a lot like Dremel. Pretty much all the systems we'll see, they may not always have this exact shuffle uh, implementation, but basically it's going to work the same way. Like you got to get data from your pre the previous stage. So again, the, the thing we're talking about today is the photon piece, that's going to run inside here on every single executor. Right? It's not like a standalone service, it's not like a standalone process running. Um, Everything's going to be uh, every, it's just going to be running inside of the implementation and then be invoked by the Java code. So, Photon is going to do a pull-based vectorized pull-based vectorized engine, and they're going to leverage what is what they're going to, what they call in the paper uh, operator kernels. But when we talk about vector-wise, we call them they call them primitives. They're basically the same thing, right? Some pre-compiled code that can do a small computational task on a vector of data. And, they're gonna, and since these are going to be written in C++, they're, they're going to be templated um, based on the, on the data type. And they're going to have different variations to deal with, you know, if I'm doing a less than, a greater than, or wh whatever the computation or, or task I want to do. Gonna, these things are going to be all uh, generated ahead of time, then compiled into the system by, by the developers. Right? We're not doing cogen on the fly for anything here. And so the way that they're going to avoid the, the cost of, of jumping to these, these different uh, these pointers to these functions are either going to be just amortizing across multiple, you know, operating on multiple tuples within a single vector, as we saw in vector-wise. But they're also going to do something they call expression fusion, we'll see in a second, where they actually can combine, combine multiple primitives if they know that they're being used you know, continuous, continuously or contiguously by a, a bunch of queries. So part of the reason I, I had you guys read this paper, other than like Databricks is obviously a huge company, and this is a pretty interesting uh, system, is that it's actually a really good paper. It's one of the better in industry ones we'll read this semester and uh, read mostly overall. Um, because most of the industry papers that are out there, they'll, they just say like, hey, this is what we did. Ta-da, right? Like how great we are. And maybe they'll scribe the details of what they did, but they don't really discuss what led them to that those engineering uh, decisions. Whereas as in the Photon paper, although they don't provide numbers for, like, you know, we tried this, we tried that, but they have nice little anecdotes of like, the things that they considered and looked into before they end up making the, the final choice that they present in the paper, right? So the one that they, they talk about that's really important is how they, this, why they decided to build a vectorized engine that, that again, was based on the vectorized model, the, the, the X100 paper, uh, rather than a just-in-time engine, just-in-time compilation engine like Hyper, um, even though they had, had they had already done that in in Spark SQL. And what they talk about is that they found that the the you know the, the, their developers are spending most of their time writing the tooling you would need to, if you have a JIT engine, to deal with a JIT engine like debugging it, profiling it, understanding what's going on. Because you basically, again, when you crash in one of these compiled engines. You, you just land in an assembly. There's no lineage information or provenance to say what part of the code in your system generated the code that crashed, right? So they had to write a bunch of tools to, to figure these things out. Whereas if you go with the pre-compiled you know, primitive approach with, you know, based on vectorwise, then at first the engine may not be as fast as the cogen system, but like you can just iterate it over and over again and more people can work on, on the project without having specialized training and you can get you know, nearly the same performance and sometimes beyond what you could get in a hyper-style vectorized engine. So that little, that little you know, uh, tidbit in the paper I thought was really interesting, and I agree with them at this point. Having gone through the experience of building a uh, hyper-style comp, you know, compilation, compilation engine here at CMU, uh, you know, I wouldn't do it again because you know, although the students you guys here in 721 are super smart, you know, there wasn't you know, a small number of students that actually could work on it. Even I struggled with it because it was like, when you crash, 
you just, you know, you land an assembly. Or we try to build an interpreter to, to help us walk through the op codes and understand, you know, debug programs. But what are we doing? We're building an interpreter, we're building you know, debugging tools rather than just writing the code to make the, the system go fast. Right? So again, that piece of uh, that piece of the paper I think I thought was was really important. And if I was building a new system today, I would I would maybe well I wouldn't I wouldn't have to deal with the JVM because you shouldn't use the JVM to build a new system, but uh, everything else they talk about I think is is still relevant, still important. The paper also mentions that the uh, the auto vector auto vectorization works pretty well uh, because most of their primitives are pretty small, but when necessary they do write some intrinsics. Uh, just to sort of force it to use SIMD in the right places. So all their operators are going to support this uh, the get next func uh, function uh, that's going to produce some column batch. Um, and they're going to choose to, to keep track of what tuples are relevant or still active you know, as they move up the, in the query plan using a position list. Remember, we, 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 we talked about this before. I think we talked about, when we talked about Velox in the execution engine beginning of the semester. Position list is just a vector that keeps track of what offsets are, are still valid in your, your batch of vectors as you're passing along. Right? Because some may get filtered out, and then rather than compacting the vector, um, you just pass along the dead tuples, but you need to keep track of which ones are still active. Right? So this is, you know, this is just literally an offset within the batch of columns that you're looking at. And recall that the alternative approach was to maintain a bitmap of active rows, and it's just a zero to say whether it's active or not at, at a given offset. Um, and so the, the paper talks about how they considered both approaches, but that they found that the, the position list just was, uh, you know, except for the extreme examples where like you're passing along all the tuples, uh, that, this is, um, that this is preferable and this performed better than the, the bitmap. And then they, if you follow this citation here in the paper, it says, recent work confirms our conclusions. That's our paper, right, that, that we wrote here uh, by Amadou, who was a 721 student. He's now a PhD student at, at MIT, you know, with Todd Mowry and some you know, other people you know, Wan, Lynn, and Matt, right? And so um, this is Amadou's master's thesis. He basically did a brute force search of, like, of just trying out all different combinations of position vectors versus the, uh, the, the bitmap under different workloads or different combinations or different hardware using SIMD and not SIMD, and he found out the, the position list is, is better overall. So, you know, this is an artifact of 721, which is cool. All right, so, uh, as I said before, they're not going to be doing the, the, the hyperstyle code generation query compilation. It also means they're not going to do the hyperstyle operator fusion, where you have multiple operators in your pipeline and you combine them together. So, they're going to do this for two reasons. One, obviously, they're not doing compilation because they want to use primitives, uh, pre compiled primitives, because it's easier for engineering. But another interesting thing they talk about, which I had not considered before before reading this, is that in order to make it understandable for their users, like, in, like debugging information and profiling information that they have to show them, but like, here's why your query ran for this amount of time, uh, if you do the hyperstyle operator fusion, it's very hard to convey to the user like, what actually you know, where, why their query might be running slow, or where they're spending mo most of their, their time. So I'll call this vertical fusion, so within the query plan, you're sort of vertically combining the different operators, and they're instead are gonna go choose something called, you know, expression fusion, or, or horizontal fusion is what I call it, within a single operator, horizontally within inside of that, I wanna fuse things together. Um, so I'll go through examples of each of these one by one, but first, you know, We'll first see the, this again from Hyper and see why and why they don't want to do this. So this is that query we had before in Hyper, right? You can see all the different pipelines here, and the in Hyper they're going to again they're doing a push-based model, and they want to fuse together all the operators within within a single pipeline. So if you focus on number four here, right, it's it's the scan on C, and then you probe this table and probe this this table. So it's basically uh, you know three three four loops nested together. So, one is this would be tr difficult to do in a, um, in a, in, you know, sorry, in using primitives. I guess it's not difficult to do. It's just like you have to pass around batches that you wouldn't go by a single, tu single tuple at a time. But now if you have to, if to tell a user, like, here's the, the query plan operator that, it, that took the most time within your query plan, you can't show them a bunch of these for loops because they're not going to know what any of this is. Because all they know is I wrote some SQL query, 
here's a, here's a query plan that looks like a query plan in every other system. And now I need a way to, to excise out exactly like how much time I spent in one for loop versus another to, to map them back to uh, the different operators. And that's not really something you can easily do, right? So again, for this usability reason, you'd be able to convey to users what's actually going on. You, know, you, you can't do this approach. So instead, they're going to do, again, what they call uh, uh, expression fusion. The idea here is that you can see you have two primitives being used over and over again, one after another within, a, within an operator. You just generate a single primitive that then can encompass both of the computations that the primitives are doing. So the example they have is you have a query here doing a lookup on some date, which means some range. Well, I, I take the between operator and can write this to be a less than equal to and a, and a greater than equal to, right, with a conjunction clause. So without expression fusion, I would have two separate functions, two separate primitives for each of these two, uh, you know, each of these two expressions, and then I just, you know, you just take the intersection of the offset lists and figure out what actually tuples match match both of them, right? And so if again, instead of having to make two different function calls over and over again, expression fusion just says I'll, I'll cogen or not cogen, like I'll create a single function that does both of them. And it's templated based on the type, so I could, I could do this, you know, these are for dates, but I would cogen ones for all other possible data types, right? And then now for the expression that I have, now it's just a single, you know, single line of code that does both of them. And so in the, you know, in the, in the VectorWise paper you guys read, that's from like 2006. Of course, that was an academic project, but even VectorWise in you know, the early days was meant to run on-prem. It wasn't a cloud system. So, you, so in that world, you had to kind of guess what your kind of queries your user are running and, and which ones should be combined together. But when you're a cloud company like Databricks, you see all the queries and you just do analytics on top of that and figure out what things are being used together and that guides you to decide, you know, sort of using your own data to decide how you want to optimize your own system. We'll see another example later on when we talk about Redshift. Uh, you know, all these systems are really designed for doing read-only workloads. But in Redshift, they looked at their own logs, their own telemetry, and they found there's a lot of people running update queries unexpectedly. So they spent a lot of time making the update queries go fast, and they wouldn't have not been able to known to do that unless they looked at their own data. So the, you know, the, these database systems uh, as a service providers are in a unique position that is, is much different than how people have built systems, database systems over, over decades, because now they know exactly what you know, queries that people are running and can decide how to optimize things. Again, rather than guessing or having, worst case scenario, having to talk to people, which is always the worst. Um, all right, so the next interesting thing that they're gonna do with Photon is how they wanna manage memory. So Spark already has a memory manager, already has memory pools. Uh, and because again, Photon is not a standalone system, you gotta run it inside of uh, Spark. Uh, you, you, know, you just don't wanna malloc anywhere inside of this C++ code. Um, because, you, again, thinking about trying to run this as a service for users, you need a way to keep track of what, you know, what that, who's using the memory, right? And so rather than rewriting a C++ memory manager and, and, and have that run alongside the, the Java one, you just rely on the existing memory management, uh, the, the Java-based memory manager. It can basically allocate blocks of memory, can keep track of it as if it was you know, any other memory in, in, the, in the JVM, and then hand those, those pointers off to the C++ code to be able to use that. So they're gonna rely on all that, the memory manager in, in Java, and they all get, so they get the reporting and all the infrastructure you need to keep profiling and, and other stuff uh, for free. The interesting thing that, thing that they do though is, and I like this paper because again, cause none, none of the other papers are gonna talk about this, because again, they're running in the lake house environment, they're running on files that they've never, potentially never seen before. They don't have accurate statistics. So they need a way to be more adaptive and dynamic to deal with certain operators needing more memory than, than maybe they originally expected. And so the way they do this is that rather than having every operator implement the capability to spill memory to disk on its own, uh, they instead have the, when, when you need memory, or you're running out of memory, you just go, the operator just goes, at, goes and asks for more. And now it's up for the memory manager up, hanging up in Java to figure out how to give you that memory to avoid the query from failing and who to take the memory from. So what they do is they basically get a list of all the currently running tasks, 
how much memory they've allocated, they find the one that has the, uh, the least amount of memory that can satisfy the, the request for the, this query that's running, and then they, they, they tell it to release it and get the memory back so they can hand it to another operator. So all the operator implementations have to have support for spilling the disk and sort of pausing and coming back and fetching things from disk as, as needed. Um, and then that way everything is sort of seamlessly integrates and not worrying about you know, running, running out of memory or you know, keeping track of memory in different locations. And again, we have to do this, and we'll see the other ways to hand, handle, uh, handle this. We have to do this because we don't know, we don't know how much memory, you know, or, sorry, how many tuples may be coming out of one operator because we don't know the selectivity of any of the filters that may be running on it. Okay, so the paper you guys, the, in the Photon paper itself you guys read, uh, I don't, they didn't really talk about query optimization um, other than maybe, maybe this last one here. But there is a earlier paper in, that, in the Spark SQL paper, they talk about their query optimizer, this thing called Catalyst, and then we had them come give a talk with us uh, a few years ago and describe what they're actually doing. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what Catalyst does, both in the context of Spark and then in, in originally for Spark SQL, but then I'll talk about what they specifically added to Catalyst to work with something like, like Photon. So again, because they don't have a robust query, a cost model, they have to be very adaptive and, and make the best of a, of a situation where they don't have accurate statistics about, uh, you know, ab about, about what the query is actually going to do. We'll see in a second how they're going to handle this or try to improve their lot by using something like Delta Lake so they can see the data when it actually arrives and collect statistics on that. But again, in the worst case scenario, if you're accessing a bunch of files on S3 you've never seen before, you have to... You know, you have to handle that. So it's a cascades optimizer where they're going to have predefined stages that are sort of handwritten or, or crafted by the, the engineers, similar to what we saw in SQL Server, where you sort of run from one stage to the next and uh, you know, do, the, do the transformations as needed. And so as expected, they're going to have logical, logical transformations, logical, physical transformations. But what is unique about Catalyst uh, compared to like the textbook definition of cascades is they're also going to put physical to physical transformations. And this is where they're going to inject the, the, the photon logic. Because they have a physical plan that's generated by the previous stage, and that could, that could just run in Spark SQL as is. But then they go back and do another pass and say, OK, when, where can I inject uh, the photon operators as needed? So SQL Server does something sort of similar to this, uh, which we didn't really talk about, where it'll run through the regular Cascades optimizer generate a physical plan, and then sum the engines that, that, that beyond just SQL Server or different vari variations of it that support distributed queries can then do another pass where they convert the physical plan to inject like distributed, dis you know, distributed operations. Um, they'll, so they'll convert a single, single, physical, single node physical plan to a distributed physical plan. And they'll, they'll do that in this, this extra last step here. So again, there's, there's, there's nothing really different for these first two stages here. This is the one that's, that's, that's relevant to Photon. So the way they're going to do this is that uh, they're going to do an additional pass over the query plan. But rather than do the normal cascades top down, they're actually going to go bottom up. And they're going to convert it to a, a Photon-specific physical plan. And the idea here is that you want to identify in which operators that are in the original physical plan that would normally run in Spark SQL can be replaced with the photon specific operators. But now we need to make sure that not only are we going to have a lower cost, but it, part of that cost calculation is going to be reducing the number of times we switch back and forth between JVM to, and C++. And so if you're going from the bottom to the top, there's most of the times the, you know, in most queries, there's more data being pa data being passed from one operator to the next at the bottom. So you start down there, try to get into the, the photon engine as much as possible, and avoid weird transitions of like halfway through going back to C++ and then coming back to the JVM. You want to try to have the longest stride going up of, of just being entirely in C++. And so this happens during query execution, sorry, query optimization before you do any, any, any execution. Because again, at this point, you know that the system knows that I have these operators that are written in Photon and I can replace the Spark SQL ones with those. This is not something you need to figure out at runtime. So this is an example from, from the paper or, or another talk. So this is, say, the original plan here, something real simple, scan a, t scan a file, filter, shuffle, and then produce some output. 
So you'll start from the, from the bottom and top. Say the, the, the file scan, you know, for whatever reason, that's still in, in Java. And then you know that you can replace the shuffle and the filter steps with the Photon implementations. So at this side, we're running in Java. So we use JNI to invoke down in C++. And then they have some landing area that they call an adapter. And that's responsible for, for you know, converting things from the row store that's coming in the Java world into the, the column store. And then you do all these vectorized processing up through Photon on this. And then when you got to go back out to Java, they have this transition stage, transition operator, that's responsible for converting the data back into the form that's expected uh, by the Java code. So these adapters and transitions, these are, you know, they're not horribly expensive, but like you're, you're basically pivoting and, and copying and moving data around. So you want to avoid having to do this as much as possible. So this is all the Java stuff, and this is all the Swivel stuff. So again, they, they take this physical plan, they take a pass through it, and decide where can they inject the, the photon-specific capabilities. All right, so the paper also talks about how they, the, sort of the two styles of adaptivity that they have, and they, have, they refer to them as sort of macro and micro, which is their terms. Um, so the macro, so the macro, the query level ad adaptivity is the stuff that we talked about before, where we can take the statistics that we've, we've collected while we're running the query at the shuffle stage and decide how we want to modify the next stage accordingly by expanding or reducing the number of workers, potentially uh, you're moving things around, uh, you're switching from a shuffle join to a broadcast join, and so, so forth, right? And that's basically all the stuff that we, that we, we talked before with, with Dremel. But then they have this other style of batch uh, level adaptivity where within an operator, like as we're actually running the, the query plan itself, we can decide within a single tuple batch or a vector, like do we want to change what implementation of that operator we want to use based on the data that, that we're seeing, right? And this is something the Photon just does for, for you automatically on the inside while it's running. This is not something that like the query optimizer has to be, has to be uh, aware of. So this is going to be very similar to the Velox optimizations that we saw way back in lecture five, where like, you know, I'll show examples of this, but like identifying my data, I thought my data was going to look this way, but it actually looks another way, or like there's no nulls, or the, they're ASCII instead of, you know, Unicode, and I can switch and permute what, what operator implementation I want to use. In the case of the Photon one, you have to have the primitive, the variation already pre-compiled, right? Obviously, because you can't switch, you know, you're not, they're not code genning on the fly. So, um, I, and so this is the, the this is basically what I already said. The, the query level optimizations, again, before each, after each shuffle stage, uh, you know, after the shuffle phase completes, you can decide what, what you want to change later on. Um, and we've already talked about shuffle for broadcast joins and current Dremel. Uh, for optimizing skew joins, the idea here is that you, um, you, you, you recognize that the data doesn't, you know, it has a different distribution, and you can change the number of executors you would have maybe for one side versus another. And then they're also going to be able to handle uh, overflowing partitions, but they're going to do something slightly different than we saw in the Dremel case. Remember, the Dremel case was you recognize that a partition starts filling up, and then you stop, and, and you do another round of recursive partitioning, and you start writing tuples to other, to other partitions instead of overflowing it. They're going to do something slightly different. I'll show in the next slide. And again, all of this is because in the lake house environment, we don't have any real statistics. So the way they're going to do overflowing partitions is that they actually can't expand the number of partitions. And I don't know whether there's something fundamental about Spark, why you can't do this, or this is just a, uh, this is a design choice of why they went, did this path, or went down this path. But to avoid a problem of a partition running out of memory, running out of space, they just allocate a, a lot of partitions, more than you actually think you would actually possibly need, right? So let's say my worker is filling up the partitions, and then I have these three partitions that are underutilized, right? Because I've allocated so many of them. So what they'll do is they'll recognize before the partition phase completes that these three are underutilized, and they make a new partition, and they have these guys just write their data into it, uh, and then just carry over the two other ones. And then they, oops, sorry. And then just blow the memory away from, from the previous partitions, uh, three and four, All right? So it's sort of like achieving the same thing as, as Dremel did, but like taking from a different approach. Like Dremel is adding partitions dynamically on the fly, 
uh, Spark is actually taking partitions away. So the end result is still the same. It's just they're doing this uh, in a slightly different, slightly different manner. Um, I don't know whether one, one, what, one is better than another, right? Because at the end of the day, you still have to have an extra step to, to move data into the new partitions, right? In the, in the, the general case, you had that redistributed operator had to run after you, you've, you've done the recursive partitioning. In this case here, you've got to funnel these guys into the new one afterwards. So there's no free lunch. It's not like one is you know, entirely better than another. I think that there's something, some aspect of, again, the Spark engineering, the Spark runtime that requires them to do it this way rather than, than take them away later on. For the batch level adaptivity, uh, again, a lot of these are going to look like the stuff we talked about in Velox. Right? The first one is if you recognize that you're, doing, uh, you're processing a string column, but the data is all ASCII characters instead of Unicode, you can switch to a faster implementation of your string functions because you're dealing with you know, one byte ASCII characters instead of you know, up to four byte Unicode characters. Right? There's more variability in, in Unicode, and so that means more branch based predictions in the CPU. So if you, if you have the sort of the fast, fast version, you just use that. For uh, if they recognize that the, the, the vectors that they're passing up uh, from one operator to the next within Photon are, are pretty sparse, then you just compact them down to s smaller memory sizes. And this will help when you do a, like a probing on a hash table, because now all the data will be collected. The, the, the relevant data will be collected together, and it's you, you know with all within a single cache line, and you can put things out uh, more quickly or do the probes more quickly. They also can leverage the uh, the, the templated nature of the primitives by identifying that they have no nulls in a vector and avoid having to check the null vector. And likewise, if they have no act inactive rows, they can avoid that lookup as well. So this is the code from the from from the paper. And so again, it's a, it's a templated C++ function where you have a Boolean that tells you whether you have any nulls uh, in processing this, or you have any, uh, and whether you have any uh, active rows that are active. So this is like this is the template of function. You always write this code as is, but then at compile time you would pass true or false at either of these, and you make different variations of the same function. Then at runtime you can say, okay, well if I know that I don't have any uh, inactive rows, then I I would I would invoke the all active ones, and then this will just get thrown away, the check gets thrown away at compile time, because you know that it's a compile time constant that this thing is always true, so you just pick i, right? So you just hit row index i, and you don't have to do this lookup in the position list. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a low, low optimization, but if you're doing this for you know, billions of tuples over and over again, or billions of batches, you know, this will definitely have uh, a big savings. Likewise, for the, the has nulls, if this thing is always true, then you know you don't have to do look, the lookup in the, the null offset. So I think they, uh, I forget what numbers they, they talked about for these, but for this compaction one, I think they do this for joins and they get like a 1.5x speed up on, on the probes. Again, that's just the probe phase. There's all much other stuff you're doing in, in your, in your, in your, when you run a query, but that's, you know, that's a, it may, it may not be the highest pull in the 10, but you know, that's a pretty significant speed up, but just doing this extra step. And I forget what the numbers they say for, for, the, for this one here. All right, so I'm going to show one graph. Uh, this is what they report as the, the improvements you're getting for, uh, with Photon enabled in, 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 in Databricks and Spark versus the uh, in Spark SQL. And you know, for TPCH, uh, a rather large data size, scale factor 3,000. So across the board, you always see the red is just faster. In some cases, the performance is quite significant, like for Q1 here. Um, for other ones, maybe, maybe less so. I think Q1 is the, like the simplest one, it's just ripping, scanning through, right? So in that case, I'm, I'm assuming most of the, the, the operators from the query plan are offloaded into the, uh, you know, to, to, to Photon, right? And again, the way I think in Databricks, I think this is still true, I think they charge like 20% more that like you specify whether you want your job to run as a photon accelerated uh, query versus like the regular Spark SQL. Right? And, and, and they'll charge you more for it because right? you're getting better performance. It's kind of a win-win for them. I mean, they had to spend the engineering time to actually build the thing, but like your query is going to run faster, uh, so it's going to use, use less compute resources, probably uses about the same amount of memory, 
but like you know, and you pay them more for it. Uh, it's, a, it's a smart move. So this is TPCH. Uh, TPCH is a precursor to uh, or sort of the original OLAP benchmark. It came from the early 90s. Um, in the paper as well, they talked about uh, getting official TPCDS results. So TPCDS is the, the successor to TPCH. It's like I think 2006. Um, and so they made a big deal when this came out in 2021 in this paper and everything that they had official uh, TPC results. Right, so this is this is their webpage for TPCC, the Transaction Processing Council. Right, they're sort of like the supposed to be the independent arbiter, a referee of database benchmarks, right? And so TPCH, TPCDS, it, th those benchmark specs are defined by this consortium. Uh, and then if you want to have be on the official leaderboard, you go get certified by the TPC people to say like, your your implementation matches the spec requirements, and then you can be listed here. So Databricks got listed in, in 2021. They're still listed, you know, still number one for running on 100,000 gigabytes for TPCDS, right? And, and they beat, the, pre the, the previous one was, um, was Alibaba from, from two, 2019. So it's not just the performance you're getting for the query itself, like how many you know, queries per second you can do. Uh, they also check to see like how much, you know, how much you're paying for this if you, if you had it paid as a service, right? So, Databricks was super excited uh, when this came out. They made a big deal about it, right? They had a the, bunch of these articles when this came out talking about how Databricks has official TPC DS results that have been audited and how they're, they're gunning for Snowflake, right? So there's a bunch of articles at this time. For this one here, they actually asked me for a quote and I wrote something, I said, at the enterprise level, maybe some CIO is gonna care about what, you, what your official TPC ranking is, but they don't make sales that way. This is actually not the full quote. Uh, what I said after this was, and only pe old people care about TPC results, uh, and, and they, they cut that off. Um, and so what do I mean by this? So the T, I mean, how many people have, I mean, you've heard of TPC agent TPC DS because you're reading the papers and seeing these things. You may not know that there's actually a consortium that is, is the one that's defining these things. So this comes out of the 1980s. Uh, it was founded by Jim Gray and, and a bunch of other database people because at the time, all these different database vendors were putting out their own, you know, making up their own benchmarks, putting out marketing stuff that says, look how much faster we are than everyone else. Uh, but then, like, you know, you couldn't reproduce the results because the, the source code wasn't available, the environments couldn't, weren't reproducible. So it's really hard to, just in terms of performance, to say one system is actually better than another in, in different ways. And so the, the, the TPC, you know, the consortium was meant to, uh, again, sort of pr provide a level playing field for everyone to understand this. But like, it mattered a lot, certainly in the 19, you know, 80s and 90s. I would say it matters less these days, although we use TPCH and TPCDS all the time. Those are good workloads to benchmark systems. But to go and get the, you know, if, if you're a new startup, to go get a, you know, official ranking and get audited, it's a, it's a laborious effort that probably just not worth it. As I'm saying, like no one's going to care. Look, I have official audited, officially audited TBC DS results. Uh, like nobody cares, because um, it, it's a, it's a you know it's a lot of work. Actually, they told me they had to go get some, drag somebody out of retirement to go do the auditing for them because nobody is around to do it anymore, right? Um, so there's another uh, website like ClickHouse has, has this thing called ClickBench. I, mean, I, I can show that next class. There's I'm not saying the benchmarks themselves are worthless. I'm saying like going through the effort to get officially audited is probably not, doesn't mean as much as, as it used to anymore. And certainly now with all these cloud database systems, as we'll see next class when we talk about Snowflake, it's getting the, you know, getting the, in, re -pre 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 -be being able to do apples to apples comparison from one system to the next is hard to do because there's just so many different layers to this, uh, to these systems these days. Uh, that it's hard to, to say, am, am, I, am I running on the exact same hardware I would get from one vendor to the next, right? Because, you know, in Snowflake, you don't say, I want to run on, you know, this instance size on, on EC2. You just say, I want this compute capacity. Same thing with Azure and, and, and other cloud platforms. So you don't actually really know what hardware you're actually getting. It's sort of hidden from you. Um, so again, like, like, I'm not saying that the benchmarks are useless. I'm just saying going down the path that, that Databricks did to get officially audited uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think it was the, well, they have a ton of money so they can do this. Like, if you're a new data startup, it's not the best use of your time. 
Again, we'll cover benchmark wars more next class with Snowflake. All right, so Photon is proprietary. So Spark is open source, but as I said, the database runtime itself, which includes Photon, is not open source. Uh, and so you can only get the acceleration that we're talking about here if you go pay Databricks money for it. But they're not the only game in town to try to accelerate Spark. Um, and so there's a bunch of other accelerators that are, are open source from various companies uh, that you can, you can then use to get Photon-like uh, improvements. But what's interesting about them is that in, rather than doing the fine grain uh, integration that Photon does, where they're replacing individual operators and deciding at runtime when to call into JVM versus, uh, versus into uh, C++ code, as far as I know, all of these systems are just co-opting or, or taking the entire query plan, ignoring the Spark runtime entirely, and running it on a separate engine. So the, probably the, 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 the one that's most popular is not the right word. The one that's probably the most well known is Apache Gluten. This is usually, previously it was called Gazelle. I think it was Intel and Alibaba. But now it's an Apache project that Intel's running. And the way, again, the way it works is that you take the Spark generates some kind of physical plan. And then you have the different mechanism to be able to take that query and run it somewhere else. And, and by converting it into substrates, you can run it on Aero, FPGAs, they have a ClickHouse support, or Velox, right? Again, they're not doing the, the on a per operator basis, they're taking the entire query plan, running it somewhere else, but you're still accessing the, or, or, or running the query through the Spark front end, through, like, through, through that, that expected interface. Um, there's another one that actually just came out two months ago from Apple. Uh, so I actually say, this is, this is, this is as I, this was showing, it's but, but, yeah, a bunch of different backends that, that'll run this. Um, the, for this one from NVIDIA, N Rapids is like their CUDA-based library that do data science stuff, right? And it's, it's, uh, it's obviously meant to run, run their GPUs. Blaze is out of a Chinese company that runs Data Fusion. And there's a new one here called Comet from Apple. That came out two, two, two months ago. That's all entirely in, in Data Fusion. Um, there's been other attempts. Uh, Gluten is you know, multiple data systems plus Velox. Uh, but Data Fusion seems to be the one that everyone is, is, is leaning towards to, to accelerate Spark these days. And I don't know what, uh, I mean, Databricks is obviously the biggest Spark vendor. I think uh, Azure or Microsoft, I think they're, they're promoting the, the Rapids one to speed things up. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is, as I've been saying multiple times, and we'll see throughout from, you know, from now to the end of the semester, is we don't have statistics because we're running on data lakes. And adaptivity will help for certain things. But you know, ideally, if we, just, if we have adaptivity plus better statistics, then that's the best world to, to be in. So what has, what has evolved and come out over the last couple of years, you know, since the first Dremel paper came out, of, of just like, instead of just assuming that everyone's going to dump their files on S3 and you, your engine's going to go try to figure out, try to make sense of it later on, the idea is that what if you provide a service or a mechanism to allow people to ingest data into your, your, your lake house or data lake, and as that data gets ingested, you then can collect statistics about it, keep track of it in your catalog, other than just like, I have these files, here's where they are. Like now you can look at the data and keep some track of some statistics. And then you can use that now in your query optimizer for your cost model. So the Photon paper, uh, I think they mentioned the Delta Lake stuff. Um, but this is, this is an open source project, but this is specific to, to Databricks, where this is their, it's, it's a standalone service, but it sits in front of, of S3 and, and Spark, where you provide a basic interface to, to send data into your lake house. And all it's really doing is just taking your updates, uh, writing them to some log file, and then in the background, the, there's this compaction process that runs, grabs the log file, converts it into Parquet, and then writes that into uh, back to S3 or, or whatever your object store is. And then when it does this conversion to Parquet, that's when they compute statistics about what's actually in the file, store that in their catalog, and then now their query optimizer can, can access it. All right? So no longer are you just, you know, some other service committing a bunch of data and then plopping it down to S3 as a Parquet file. Delta Lake will generate the Parquet file for you, but because it actually has to scan the data and put it into the columnar format of Parquet, 
they, they, that's when they collect statistics. So they're not the first per people to do this. Um, it actually, one of the first versions of this was from, from Caldera as an extension to Impala, this thing called Kudu. And it was basically the same idea, although I don't think they were writing exactly to Parquet. I think they, they had their own proprietary format. But same thing. You had this, this, this system that could do fast uh, updates into a distributed file system. Um, and they collected statistics about when the data was, was being ingested. And they would then store that in the catalog and then feed that to the query optimizer that you could then access through, through Impala. This one, again, you, I think in Delta Lake, I think you can run SQL queries on it. I know in Hootie and Iceberg you can um, using other systems. But this one was like a really low level, like get and set interface to do these things. Uh, and then if you ever wanted to run SQL, you would, they, they would tell you to oh, run it on Impala, right? So again, this was, this was 2015, well before Delta Lake uh, came along as, as a way to can help sell, uh, sell, help sell Impala from Cloudera. So again, same way, like, I think I've already said this. In the same way Databricks is like the huge company, the like, you know, database data, data company now, that was Cloudera 10 years ago. But most of you probably never heard of Cloudera before we started talking about it here, right? Actually, who here has heard of Cloudera before this class? Nobody. Right? They were, like, that was the hottest company, right? They were huge. Um, and so it sort of shows you, how, shows you how quickly things can change in, in uh, technology. All right, there's other alternatives to this. Uh, Apache Hootie, what came out of, I think it was Uber in 2016. And a lot of this text is basically saying the same thing that I said for Delta Lake and, and uh, Kudu, right? It's a, it's a service where you can ingest data. Uh, I think Hootie can support Parquet and Orc files generating those, but they're going to collect statistics about the data as it arrives, sort it in a catalog, and then expose it through uh, different sources. And so this is actually the diagram they have on their homepage, and it shows you exactly what I've been saying. Like, here's all your front end stuff. Like, you have these updates coming in from your operational databases upstream for your application. They're feeding into Hootie the updates of, to, to the log. It'll write them out to what they call Lakehouse platforms, but this is basically HDFS, S3, whatever the, the, the Google, Google Cloud Storage, and so forth. Right, right, right to your object store here, and then you update the, the catalog. Uh, I think that's a that's Amazon Glue, I forget what that one is. That's Hive, the Hive catalog, H catalog. You update the meta store, the catalog, like here's what my data looks like, here's the statistics about it. And then you have the various query engines that we've been talking about be able to read from the, the catalog, figure out what's in there, use the statistics that they generated, and then process the data from that, that the, the service has generated. All right, so that's how these things fit into this, right? We've been talking about all this stuff back, back over here. This is just a way to get the data in to, to the system rather than just writing it directly to the, the, the object stores. The next one, again, that we've been talking about that the catalog teams have been working on is Apache Iceberg. This one came out of Netflix in 2017. And again, it's basically the same thing as I just said. You're ingesting data into the, the, to the system, collecting stats, um, and uh, exposing it to, to the query engines. So we'll see next class when we talk about Snowflake. This is the only way Snowflake is actually going to be able to support ingesting uh, or querying data that isn't stored in their managed storage. So they added support for this in 2021 because prior to this, the only way you could query data in Snowflake is you had to insert it into Snowflake. But now with Iceberg, they can actually feed that into uh, their own system. I forget whether they do in, uh, wholesale copies or they can access the data where, where, where it resides. We'll see the same transition with, with Redshift, where Redshift only had managed storage. They're not, they weren't supporting Iceberg, but then they added support to read arbitrary files off of S3 later on. OK? So again, I think Photon is a really interesting system um, because, it, again, rather than like, what? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's true. Right? So Photon is a really interesting system, but you see like, the lengths that they had to go to, like ex dealing with the legacy code that they, 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 were, that they had to support. And from a business decision, I think it's the right move to like, don't throw away which, what is already working and you're making a lot of money on for your existing customers. Improve it by, by being more fine-grained in how you integrate the new technologies and new capabilities based on all the, the things we've talked about throughout the entire semester. 
right? But certainly, if you were going to build a, a system from scratch today, uh, you wouldn't want to go down that path of like taking some JVM monster and, and you know, trying to, trying to work around it. It doesn't make sense to build anything in Java these days. Uh, yeah, yes, Java is getting better. The JVM is getting a lot better. The new garbage collector that just came out a year or two ago is way better than, than it used to be. Um, there are proprietary JVMs that you can get, uh, something like Azul, uh, that's faster than like OpenJDK or the, the one from Oracle. This is what the, all the high frequency traders use. But again, if you're trying to run something at scale, you don't want to pay a license for every single node to use that proprietary JVM. Um, so building something in Rust, C++, Zig is probably going to be the, the right choice, um, not, not the JVM. But again, there's a lot of systems that, that are in this path. And we saw this with uh, when we mentioned Presto and Trino, right? Presto, the one that, that is out of Facebook, they're replacing their Java runtime with, um, with Velox. And again, that's a wholesale replacement for the entire query engine rather than the fine grained thing that Photon does. Whereas the Trino guys are just going to deal with, they, they decided they're, they're going to stick with Java. Legacy code. All right, so again, next class on Monday, we're going to talk about Snowflake. Um, and again, the Snowflake architecture is going to look like, like Dremel. They're going to be, the paper you're going to read from is from 2016 is going to be more about the, the managed storage that they provide, where like, the data center controls everything. But then we'll talk about how they integrate with Iceberg and, and be able to handle updates uh, in, in the newer versions of Snowflake. But again, the high-level architecture is going to look like the same. It's going to smell a lot like VectorWise in X100 because one of the co-founders of Snowflake was the guy that wrote X100 at a CWI. So we'll, we'll see a lot of similarities of, of, of the two systems, except that you know, the VectorWise stuff we talked about was running on-prem, where the paper you guys read about running in the cloud as a service. OK? You got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of snake eyes.